atmosphere this weekend. They've had some tremendous racing, and unfortunately, it's been a messy start to this race, James. Yeah, it really has, but uh, as we're riding down here Del with Coyne, boy, a weekend that didn't start off too great is getting worse by the moment. At turn one last year, we were running second on the last lap here and got punted and taken out of the race, and now we got Tracy's taking two of them out already, and... Uh, it's a shame, you know, we, we had a really good car this morning. We were six quick this morning, and Bruno was moving up to the field, so we felt we could have, you know, we're six in the points this deep into the season. We were really counting on some more points here. So what has Bruno you know, said to you? He just he tried to take off. He said it doesn't feel right, so I'm broke. Looks like the left rear is a little askew, so. Another tough break for Dale Coyne Racing this weekend. Uh, what a shame. Thank you, Bill Stevens. There was Bruno putting the steering wheel back on that car. Yes, equal six in the points uh, with Oriol Servia coming into this weekend was Bruno. A good start to the season with uh, three finishes among the top uh, six or seven places. But a uh, disappointing start to this race. So Catherine Legg is still running, however. She has just made a pit stop to top off with fuel. She's back in the 14th position. Uh, but uh, we're going to go back uh, to be one more lap, I think, before we go back to green. Here is Greg Rahal in the Medizone car, the second of the Newman Haas Lanigan cars. He has just topped off with fuel at the back of the pack now in what will be 15th place. It's going to be a tough race for uh, for him now, but I kind of feel his pain. I had somewhat, somewhat of a similar afternoon myself uh, earlier today. So as you see, PT pulling out of the pits again. But you With a new chrome horn on the front of that car, just, huh? You just one more, but like I said, we, they must be running out down there at Foresight Championship Racing. Yeah, the good news is, of course, a brand new DPO one chassis this year. There weren't, there weren't many spares for the first few races. Nowadays, panels, uh, the guns at Inland Motorsports Technology have been working really hard. The, the teams are certainly well equipped now, and Carl has auto that uh, supplies the bits. They've got, they've got plenty of parts, but uh, new, that uh, Foresight Championship Racing is getting through them this weekend. The temperature there, 83 degrees uh, Fahrenheit to today. It's a good bit warmer than it has been the rest of the weekend. And it's going to be interesting to see how that plays into the strategies and perhaps the aerodynamic setup on these cars because uh, warmer temperatures and you know, slightly more certainly more humidity today does tend to affect the aerodynamic balance of these cars particularly through these very quick corners James well exactly the, most of the corners here are fourth gear about 120 miles an hour for these cars and they do generate a lot of downforce and as the temperature of the air gets more you actually lose grip and with the DPO one I'm not actually sure whether it affects it affects the balance of the car meaning how much relative grip front to rear so uh, obviously that's gonna have an effect and then of course as the track warms up, you're going to have an effect on the tires. The tires start to overheat a bit, maybe get a bit greasy. So we are heading back to the line for a restart here in Portland. Sebastian Bourdais will lead them with 10 laps in the books. Well, our 45-minute race here in Cleveland. And here comes the green flag one more time. And once again, it is Sebastian Bourdais who makes a great restart. And he pulls out immediately five or six car lengths over Willpower. There is Justin Wilson looking to the inside of Robert Dorbos. That is the battle for fourth and fifth places. Justin Wilson, he qualified back in the eighth position, but he's made a great charge in the early stages of this race. But here comes Dorbos again, looking to the inside in turn three. This is exactly what happened between himself and Graham Rahal. But a half a dozen laps to go. This time, Wilson sees him coming and lets him go. Probably a wise move. Probably a wise move, especially considering Robert still has to serve his stop and go penalty, I believe. I don't think he's had his drive through yet. Sorry, not stop and go. It'll be a drive through. So uh, there's no point just going wheel to wheel with him, A, this early in the race, and B, knowing that he's going to have to pit probably this lap anyway. So Justin Wilson's going to be moving up a spot now. He will be back into the fourth position, which from his eighth grid spot will be a great move for him in the first 11 laps. Yes, it will indeed. And uh, so the heads up driving, as we can see, Dolbos pulling off to the left of the road, the right of our screen. You'll see a flash of the black car, will you? Actually, not quite. But he is serving now his drive through penalty. That will drop into the back of the pack. Here we are, 11 laps completed now by Sebastian Bourdais. He has set the fastest lap of the race, just over one minute, one minute point two three four. That lap was a one minute point four. Here is Dawn Boss making his drive through penalty. 50 miles an hour all the way down the pit lane, and then he could, will rejoin. We probably lose about 32 seconds, we reckon, in making a drive through penalty on this race track, and that will put him more than a half a lap behind. It's going to be tough to come back from that, but at Cleveland, there is a bit of a propensity for yellow flag. So he might get a lucky caution uh, in the near future, which would bring him back to the tail end of the field, which would really help him in his, uh, his quest to kind of move forward. There's an interesting battle right here now between Alex Tagliani and Dan Clark. They are fighting for fifth place, and, uh, and Dan was very close to Alex at that restart, and he is still following him 
him right now. So a little uh, little tussle going on there in the midfield. Isn't it? Just, uh, just talking briefly about caution. There were nine caution periods last year. We certainly don't have a, hope, hope we don't have anything near, near that. In the previous four years, we had an average of about three cautions per race. We already had two this afternoon, but there is that battle for, between Alex Tagliani leading into the corner there with Dan Clark right behind him. And Tagliani, along with his teammate Justin Wilson, who's a car ahead of him here, they've both moved up well in the early stages. Wilson started eighth, Tagliani ninth. Now they're running in fourth and fifth. Heading now through turn three into turn four. It's all about compromise through these sections. There's such quick corners, surface changes in the middle. It's a very difficult track to get a set of four, a very difficult track to get a really consistent lap on. So uh, Alex Tagliani now, a little bit of pressure on him, but he's doing a good job for the R-Sports team. Of course, you said Jeremy's teammate, Justin Wilson, right in front of him. They're, uh, they're doing very well. Dan Clark has had a very rough start to this season, and I know that he'd really enjoy a good, solid result here. Obviously, his teammate has had some success as we ride on board with Will Power. Yeah, yeah. Dan Clark had a good result to last time out in Portland. A lot of people thought he was lucky to avoid a, a penalty for pushing Grant Rahal on the road, but let's have a look on board with Will Power. Let's just uh, watch him a little bit uh, on this lap of the Burke Lake Front Airport, and then James will have you comment on how the car seems to be looking at this early stage of the this race will power in second place. So he has to work hard through those corners. You said earlier on he's been in fourth gear generally through most of these corners around about 120 miles an hour and you can see how that steering wheel is really moving around in his hands James. And that's the thing as you go across these uh, crowns especially through this corner here there's a huge undulation in the road just look every time that that wheel is shaking in his hands that is forces, G-force is trying to pull it out of his hands. At 120 miles an hour, this DP1 chassis will generate a lot of downforce, a lot of grip, and that makes the steering very heavy as we go through this quick chicane at the end of the lap, heading now onto the front straight, very pumpy section there as well, but Will seems to have a very well-balanced race car right now, and he's doing a very good job. It's a little over, just a little under two seconds now uh, behind Sebastian Borde. He was actually a bit quicker on that lap, so although Sebastian's quick, Will is not letting him run away with this one. Well, that was the fastest lap of the race we were, we, as we were on board with Will Power, and it's very flat here. You can see some marker cones there on the both sides of the track, but it's very flat and featureless and difficult to pick out your turning points, isn't it? There's very few reference points at this track because it is so flat and uh, and it is so wide. I mean, I remember the first time I ever took a car out onto the, onto the streets here, onto the airport here, you got washed. You just didn't know which way it went because of just so much room. But then you get up to speed and it never seems like there's enough, especially through this corner. There's the one wall that you can really hit. I know PT found it a few times last year through the course of the weekend, as, uh, as you do. And uh, like I said, this is one of the trickiest corners here. It's a low grip. They've resurfaced it. It's very low grip through there. And it's very bumpy on the exit, but it's still wicked quick. And it's not, probably not quite as bumpy as it has been in the past. Though. They've done a little bit of paving there on the apex of those two corners and perhaps just smoothed it up just a little bit anyhow. Just a bit, yeah. It's Whoa. one of those marginal things. A little bit of oversteer there as he tries to get 750 horsepower from this Cosworth engine down to the ground. He's on the black sidewall Bridgestone tires, a slightly harder compound, maybe not giving him quite as much grip as he tries to get on the power. And it's interesting this weekend, there doesn't seem to be much difference in time between the red sidewall tires, the option tires, and the standard black sidewall tires. It's uh, the, the, the red tire they're using this weekend. It's the first time they've brought that tire to Cleveland. It is, however, the same red tire that they used, well, actually it's the same black tire, I believe, from last week, in, two weeks ago, in Portland. But the first time that particular tire has been brought to this racetrack. And most of the guys through practice and qualifying were finding uh, that the black tires are almost as quick as the reds. Very little difference between those two, two tires. In fact, some drivers were quicker on the blacks. Now, what, did you see which tire Sebastian was on? I think, I think he may be on the reds, actually. Yeah, I think he is, and uh, yes, he is. And he's trying to, I think you know, a lot of teams were, were thinking maybe we can get the red tires out of the way and then concentrate on the blacks later on. But here again is Dan Clark moving to the inside of Alex Tagliani. That battle continues. They are side by side into turn one. And again, a clean pass from Dan Clark. Very well done. Dan ran extremely strong here last year. If you remember, he was running third in the late stages of the race until an errant pass on... Uh, on Mario Dominguez on the last lap took them both out of the race, I believe. Or was it was it Mario was trying to pass him, or was he trying to pass Mario? I forget now. He was trying to pass Mario, I think it was, for second place. I think you're right, yeah. Lap. And on the exit, he tried to pinch Mario down, lost control of his car, ended up taking out both cars. So always a track that Dan Clark's run well at and uh, doing well again now. 
Yeah, and the, the last time around it was again Will Power that was a little bit quicker than Sebastian Bourdais. A new fastest lap of the race at 58.719. That compares to the pole time of 56.363. There again, almost identical time that time by Sebastian Bourdais of 58.726. A couple of tenths quicker he was than Will Power on that lap. And everybody else is down in the 59s or the 60s, aside from Robert Dornbos, who did a 58.9 that time around. Robert Dornbos, he was complaining about that penalty. He said he thought it was a legitimate pass, and he shouldn't have been penalised, and it's ruined our race. That's what he's been saying over the radio. But we disagree, do we not, James? Absolutely. So there is Sebastian Bourdais. We have 17 laps in the books, a one hour and 45 minute race, and Bourdais lead. <laughs> Power. Welcome to our viewers all around the world, whether you're watching us on Eurosport 2 or Fox Sports International, anywhere around the world. We're glad you could be with us, RDS in Canada as well. My name is Jeremy Shaw with James Hinchcliffe. We're in the early stages of the Grand Prix of Cleveland. It's round five of this year's Champ Car World Series. We're looking at Justin Wilson. He seems to be out on his own there, but he's, uh, in fact, he's in fourth place. By the way, behind already the top three. It's Bourdais who leads Will Power in second place. Less than two seconds back. Then a gap of about four seconds to Simon Paginot, the second of the team Australia cars in third place. And then this battle here. It's Justin Wilson and Dan Clark, the two Englishmen battling over fourth and fifth with the second of the R Sports cars, Alex Tagliani, teammate to Justin Wilson, rounding out the top six. And you can see now, this is the problem that Cleveland presents. Dan Clark managed to catch right up to Justin Wilson. There was about a two-second gap there, and he caught that up in almost two laps as we look at a nice little train going on here. But through these fast corners at Cleveland, the wings on these cars, they'll lose downforce in the turbulent air behind another car. And once you get within about a second of another car, you start to lose grip, and it's tough to make that last pass as we see... Is it Paul Tracy looking down the inside? It is Paul Tracy. He got Tristan Gomedy through that corner to uh, move himself up to 11th place now. So PT sort of on the rebound from a bit of a rough start. So he hasn't forgotten how to make a clean pass. That's good to see. That was Paul <laughs> Tracy. That was a battle for 11th place now. So he's already got past two or three guys has PT. Tristan Gomedy, he's... He's sporting a very stiff right leg. He had a huge crash in a test at Road America earlier this week. In fact, both PKV drivers crashed on, ironically, what was, what was it, in fact, due to be their final laps of a two-day test. Tristan Gomedy crashed at the bottom of turn eight, wrote off his car. That car's got, had to, the chassis has had to go back to Elan Motorsports Technologies in Georgia to be repaired. And Neil Jani also crashed as well, not quite as heavily, but still did a lot of damage to his Red Bull car. Gomedy, though, he really did injure his leg, and he's in quite a lot of pain this weekend. And it seems to be struggling in the early stages, down now in 12th place behind Paul Tracy. PT there, we can move on. Ryan De Yell, so yes it is. So PT now up into the top 10. He just passed Ryan De Yell, the Scotsman. He's uh, doing a good job in the second of the Pacific Coast Motorsports cars. His teammate Alex Ficky already out of the race after just uh, just uh, three laps into the into the event. Figgy was out, but De Yell is picking up the cudgels and doing a very nice job. That's right, Figgy went out with gearbox problems early, crushing for him after a really good qualifying performance, but now it's uh, Ryan Dial running inside the top 10, or I guess he's just lost 10 positions, sorry, to Paul Tracy. But now Paul has a little bit of breathing room. Let's see if he can lay down some quick laps and catch up to the group in front of him. He's doing a nice job. He really seems to have settled down. He's made these passes. There is Robert Dornbosch now onto the tail of Jan Halen. Now he's going to try to make a pass. That is a battle for 13th and 14th. He dives to the inside, leaves his braking way too late, almost takes out Tristan Gomedy, and he just about gets away with it. Is he, is he, is he defending his line here again? Initially down towards turn three. Yeah. I think there's going to be another penalty coming his way. Well, they're certainly going to be reviewing that because that was not the... I mean, I would say right there he did once again deviate from the racing line, but because the track is so wide here at Cleveland, Champ Car might let him get away with that, but it's speculative right now. Just the fact you can see that plume of dust uh, uh, coming off the rear tires from that car shows that he's off the racing line, and uh, I think uh, Tony Cotman in race control is going to be certainly, as you say, James, if you're re reviewing that, and maybe it will be another penalty. Dornbos reckons his race already has been ruined by, he reckons, the uh, officials. I think we disagree. 
agree firmly with him on that score. And now he's perhaps brought it on upon himself again. <laughs> that wasn't even close. I mean, like, that, that wasn't even. Uh, there was no judgment there at all. That was that was 100 percent guilty as charged. So uh, he, you know what? I wouldn't be surprised if Chen Car. Uh, okay, here we go. This is it's just oh, Wilson. Awesome, just putting Dan a wheel up on getting it, by Justin the Wilson. That was why. That was why he got the run there because Justin just straight a wheel onto the exit of turn one and. Uh, Dan Clark just jams it in there into turn three.